life Whether you're ready or not Sometimes it's rough And it takes all that you've got But he's been here Just waiting for you to not To take his hand I welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guests are Dr. Christopher Kazer and his wife Jennifer. They've written a book, uh, The Seven Big Myths About Marriage, and it's a, a reasoned uh, explanation of marriage and using sociological data and things to uh, make the case for Christian marriage. It's a beautiful book and a very solid book. Yeah. Good to see you, Doug. You too, Padre. And what's going on in Battle Ready? <sighs> Same as always. Fighting the good fight. All right. Yeah, I got my I Am Warrior t-shirt on, Ephesians 6, 12. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of darkness, against the wicked rulers of the heavenly realms. I thought this was appropriate considering the show tonight because our battle against, you know, those forces out there that are attacking marriage must be looked at first and foremost in that spiritual right, sense. Right. You know, the devil despises marriage. He mm -hmm. despises a good, holy marriage. He right. despises what God does with marriage in the world. St. John Paul II said, what? All of society flows to the family. That family is centered upon that marriage, the mm -hmm. beauty of that marriage. You uproot and, and, and tear at that marriage, as is, we see happening in so many ways, on so many levels. You hurt all the society. You know, when marriage crumbles and families crumble, society crumbles. And there's no question about it. And the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, you mentioned right before the show, has this great civilizing effect, I like it when you yeah, said that, yeah. on all of the world. Mm -hmm. All right, And the teachings on marriage, the understanding of the truth, God's design for marriage, we find in the Catholic Church, is what is going to and has for centuries kept our societies afloat. Well, Christianity you know, reaches out to the weakest, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to love those in need and have a special care solicitude for them. And uh, certainly for children and for the dignity of women, you know, Christianity has upheld right. uh, marriage and family, women and children. And, and that's not the case uh, with what we see in pagan nations and things sure. over the centuries. But so yeah, in, in the Battle Ready rallies, I'm still traveling and doing the rallies all over the country, thank God, and, and uh, that's a big portion of the talks. You know, if anybody's interested, you know, check out BattleReadyStrong.com, our website, BattleReadyStrong.com, but know that if I, you know, when I do Battle Ready rallies, a lot of the, the rallies are emphasizing the importance of really having a strong marriage. I would say when it comes to marriage, you know, you want to marry somebody equally yoked. You know, our Lord talks about this big yoke in the old pioneer days and the two mm -hmm. oxen attached to it, you know, and they're moving along and one turns, the other's got to go with it. Yeah, it's a great image for marriage, but mm -hmm. one gets stuck in the mud and decides not to move, you got problems. So not only do you need to marry somebody equally yoked, you need to marry somebody who's a fighter, someone who is ready and willing to do everything necessary to push, pull, move your spouse along to complete the task, to mm -hmm. accomplish the goal, to get to heaven and be a great witness by the grace of God in this world of doing that. So mm -hmm. I'm excited about the show tonight. It's uh, just a you know, great discussion before the show with them and, and um, right. a very important topic. And I wanted to get your input, Doug, on a quote here. This is from the Catechism. Actually, it's from the Code of Canon Law, quoted in the Catechism. It says, the matrimonial covenant by which a man and woman establish bes between themselves a partnership of the whole of life is by its nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. So that's the code's definition of marriage. And it goes on to talk about the marriage bond that arises between the spouses, which by its very nature is perpetual and exclusive, and that uh, it's sealed by God himself. This is the line that caught me. The consent by which the spouses mutually give and receive one another is sealed by God himself. That he's the author of that bond, mm -hmm. we could say and raise the dignity of a sacrament, the marriage uh, has the presence of Christ there in that mm -hmm. sacrament. So I wanted to put the question to you about the experiential aspect of that bond in, in marriage that you've seen, that you've experienced. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I, the one thing I like in there is about the, the, the give and receive part mm -hmm. that's mentioned in there because you hear a lot of times that marriage is a give and take thing. 
And I, I've, I've always really been bothered by that because marriage should be a give and receive or give and give. Therefore, mm -hmm. you do receive. You don't take. You know, there's a willingness and a giving, which is much more in tune with the, the gift of, of Christ on the cross. Um, that part stands out. But the idea here, that really, from what you read, what jumps in my mind is um, the first time I heard it put that when the married couple takes the wedding vows, and that sacramental marriage, that authentic marriage is there, God creates a new entity. There's this entity that is of three people. It's a God and the husband and the wife. And the entity is exclusive to those two. Now, and it's an until death, until one of the spouses stops breathing. That entity is exclusive to those right there. Entity being bond? The bond, oh, okay. yeah. And it's this, it's this spiritual thing that is alive. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a thing that sits mm -hmm. there. I heard a priest put this years and years ago in a homily somewhere as it, my travels around the country, that there is a living, active grace in your marriage. Call upon it, mm -hmm. right? It's God's life in that marriage, mm -hmm. the sacrament, right. elevated right. to a sacrament. Right. Therefore, the presence of God is in there, mm -hmm. working, doing. We have the opportunity and the free will to cooperate with that grace or not, to cooperate right. with what that entity is all about or not. Mm -hmm. But that that entity is so unique and so personal and so beautiful that even though there are millions of marriages, God still has reserved this one for just you two, mm -hmm. the husband and the mm -hmm. wife and God. And until one passes away, one dies, stops breathing, that entity is still there. Mm -hmm. And after they die, even if one of the spouses remarries after the one has passed away, mm -hmm. It'll be a different entity than this one. This mm -hmm. one is reserved for them for all time. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's just theirs. Mm -hmm. And there's something so personal and beautiful and truly romantic, if you will, yeah, about yeah. that. I think of, of, of Genesis when Adam says after Eve is created and presented to him, finally, he says, after all the creation that he's been shown, this one, he says, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That speaks to that entity mm -hmm. that was taken from his own side mm -hmm. and, and brought together mm -hmm. right there at that moment. Mm -hmm. It's, there's a depth and a mystery that I would simply just, I'll stop by saying this. St. Therese said that there are certain mysteries of God that really we shouldn't talk too much about. We should just be silent, pray, and meditate upon. And mm -hmm. I think marriage, had, there's a part of marriage mm -hmm. that really just needs that. I'm married to this woman, and it's until death. Mm -hmm. And there's something so beautiful about that. I'm so thankful for my wife, Denise, and uh, the great gift that God has given me um, in her, in my marriage. So. Okay. Well, that's a good start for our show tonight because we'll be talking about marriage and uh, talking about the book, The Seven Big Bi Myths About Marriage. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. Tonight, our guests are Jennifer and Chris Kayser. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. You've written a great new book, and we forgot to give you your credentials, but you are teaching at Princeton, an Ivy League school with Robert George. Princeton, an Ivy League school. I said I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, regularly, you're at Loyola Marymount University right. out in L.A. Mm -hmm. So you're in the, you know the culture. You see the culture. It's kind of a real culture-setting place out there. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. For and, sure. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> Well, let's talk about uh, what marriage is to kick off this discussion. Um, what do you, how do you describe it in the book? Well, what I try to help my students uh, to understand is the difference between what I call a covenant marriage on the one hand mm -hmm. and a contract marriage on the other. So covenant marriage involves both parties giving themselves 100% to the other party. And in doing that, in pledging uh, unconditional love, which is what the marriage vow is about, right, in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health till death do us part, they create a family bond with each other. Now that's all in contrast to a contract marriage, where it's sort of an exchange of goods and services, where they're not really pledging themselves, they're giving goods and services, and it's not about unconditional love. It mm -hmm. says in a covenant, in a contract marriage, the basic idea is, well, I'll love you, under certain conditions. Now, usually they don't say this in the vow. They don't say, I'll yeah. love you as long yeah. as you're healthy and yeah. as long as we're rich and as long as things are great. Yeah. But that's sort of what they're getting at. I'll love you until further notice, until you right. don't you know, match up to the, right. what I hope 
And certainly the language of covenant is taken <coughs> up in our scriptures in the Old Testament. But uh, even wasn't even before this before Revelation. It was had a natural reality to it. This idea of complete commitment, right? And but the essential point is that it forms this family bond that is never broken. And even though there might be betrayals or human failures mm -hmm. or weakness, it still endures. Yeah, I mean, if you think about family bonds, they really mm -hmm. are permanent and unconditional. So we're parents, and mm -hmm. once we became parents, that relationship of parent to child continues as long as that child's alive. And, you know, I might be a good father, I might be a bad father, they might be a great kid, they might be a, right. a kid that has a lot of problems, but right. this is my son, yeah. this is my daughter, no matter what. And I think, hopefully, almost everyone has experienced that unconditional love from their own parents. Not right. everyone, sadly, but, but hopefully most people have, and so they can understand, my parent loves me. Mm -hmm. You know, even if I were to do something horrible, my mom, my dad would still be there for me. And so, when you get married, in a covenant marriage, that's what you're promising, right. you're promising, Tell right. death to us part no matter what. So it's a very radical commitment. And I think that's why our Lord raised it to a sacrament because it re does reflect something of God's love, mm -hmm. right? God loves us all unconditionally. And in marriage, we promise to love our spouse unconditionally. And then if we're blessed with children, that love extends also to the children. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the children aspect of it, Jennifer. I know you, you all have seven kids. That's right. And what mm -hmm. are the age range? 22 to nine. To nine. Yeah, about two years apart. And does that change things when you start having kids? Or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it Expand changes even that. more when they become teenagers. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's really difficult. I think one of the things that young mothers face is, uh, particularly if they've been well-educated or they've kind of been on a path where they, you know, found a lot of meaning and a lot of identity in, um, in the classroom or in a job, and then all of a sudden they're home um, mm -hmm. taking care of children. This was something I really struggled with because the women who... Uh, were interested in early childhood development in college, had sort of a flawless, seamless transition into mothering. And I was like, I never liked kids. I never babysat. I was like, ah, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. they're loud and they're irritating. And uh -huh. so then when I had kids, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is really hard. Right. And um, I think we have to just acknowledge that everybody has a, a more difficult time and right. that it's not sort of a moral judgment. If parenting is more difficult for you, you're not an right. inferior person. Right. Um, it definitely can cause, it's definitely hard on the marriage, I think, at first. I mean, it's mm -hmm. unifying, but it's also chaotic. Right, right. You know, you love your child so much, that brings you together. Mm -hmm. you're, you're both convinced this is the cutest, smartest, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, most wonderful yeah. being in the world, and, yeah. then, and then also somebody's gotta change the diapers. So, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it's both. But you do talk about how it gets easier after the first few. You know, one of the things I wish somebody mm -hmm. had told, I learned this from Catherine Pakalik, and mm -hmm. she said, it's never more difficult than when you have your seventh child. And I wish that I had known that at the time. Um, it can never get harder than that because by the time you have your seventh, generally they're about 12, mm -hmm. you know, and then they can start helping. And you yeah. can't really see the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel until then. Yeah. It does get easier. The children do help. Okay. They're invested. They like having mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. Um, so it does definitely get easier. And you kind of learn, right, what, what's really a problem, you what do needs learn. to be addressed. You do. And, You're yeah. just a beastly parent to your first child. <laughs> I mean, you just want to go back and apologize. And I just, I spend half my life apologizing yeah. to my oldest daughter. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. Yeah. You, you do learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And is she out of prison now? I know. <laughs> She's going to put me Girl. in prison. She's on parole. She's on parole. Going to call right. CPS. So there's improvement then. I know. Yeah. The yeah. things my mother right. did to me should be documented. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now, did you go? Go to college? Did y'all get married right out of college? Or? Yeah, we. I went to Boston College, yeah. and she went to Whittier College, and then we met while we were still in college. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's. I think with early marriage, especially when you're having kids right away, it is. It is a challenge, but it's also, I think, something very beautiful about it. I mean, especially uh, we were talking about this before when when your children are sleeping, when they're up and, and causing trouble, that, that can be uh, stressful sometimes. Yeah. But when they're sleeping and you see them, how beautiful they are in yeah. there, it's really. I don't know, there's something that really warms the heart. Yeah. And you feel and then, proud. Yeah. People, people always stop and say, you know, your children are so beautiful and you feel young and proud mm -hmm. and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's nice, you know, it's nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you say uh, with great enthusiasm and conviction, and I love this, that you wish you had more kids. Yeah, right? that's a big regret. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. person told me that, that um, don't ever, you know, don't stop having kids. I had some problems and so we did stop, but we, we maybe could have pushed through the problems. And I yeah. tell everybody I know, don't ever, 
you're never going to regret having the children that mm -hmm. you have. You're never, ever, ever going to look and go, oh, that seventh, I wish I didn't have that seventh. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, people say this, and I don't think you should actually say to young parents, it's going to go so quickly because they can't see that. Mm -hmm. They can't. They're in the middle of it. They have a toddler screaming, and, and, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's irritating to hear that. But we know it does go quickly. So I think a better thing is you know, the days are very long. And it's very challenging, but the years do fly by. So, so really treasure the kids and the time because if we'd had two, we would be totally done. Mm. I mean, thank mm. heavens for our nine-year-old. Mm. I, I don't even know what yeah. I would do without a little imaginative, lively little being at home right now. Yeah. Yes, I, we, I wish we had had more. Yeah, one yes. of the most beautiful things I think is to see the interaction among the yeah. kids. Mm. I mean, I just yes. love it to see, you know, the 16-year-old and the you know nine-year-old, or the 22-year-old and the the 14-year-old. I I just mm -hmm. I really like that. You know, mm -hmm. see the boys out throwing the ball or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, when we're gone, hopefully not mm -hmm. soon, but you know, right. hopefully they'll they'll have that together. They're al you know? already they're depending on each other exactly. more and more. Yeah. And exactly. that's something you don't know is going to happen when they're little. All they do is fight. You know, mm -hmm. right. and yeah. then all of a sudden there's this gradual shift, and you're like, everybody said this would happen. I mm -hmm. didn't believe them. And it starts to happen, and they become friends, and that is such a rewarding yeah, thing to it really see happen. Is. Yeah, a society is being formed, right? A culture is being formed. Mm -hmm. right? so mm -hmm. it's a, Doug likes to always remind us about that fundamental cell, right? That's the family is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, all a society depends on, as John yeah. Paul said, goes right yeah. to the family. Yeah. What is it that you think um, brings people to that point where they don't want to have any more than two or three? I mean, there's many different forces yeah. that are hitting us from different sides, but. But, you know, what is it that really causes us to say, oh, two's enough, oh, I just can't yeah. go past that, well, I or think, three, or whatever? Yeah, I think, I think part of it is uh, many people in our culture think that having uh, lots of money is really going to be the place where they find happiness. And there's a good reason for that in the sense of uh, advertising sort of bombards us with the idea that we need this product, we need that product mm -hmm. in order to be happy. And, and if we don't, uh, you know, have lots of money, we can't get all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's actually been a lot of research, and I talk about it in the book, that uh, once you're out of poverty, that is to say once you have three meals a day and you're sleeping in a bed and you've got shoes on your feet, basically more amounts of money don't make any difference for happiness. Mm -hmm. And people are really surprised at this, but it's very well documented. I mean, there's lots of uh, lottery winners that they interview them and they say, yes, you know, for the first few months I was overjoyed, and basically I went back to the way, the mm -hmm. the way I was. Mm -hmm. So once you're out of poverty, basically, it doesn't really matter whether you're making, you know, thirty thousand dollars a year, a hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't yeah. doesn't make a big mm -hmm. difference. But what does make a difference? Love, okay. right? You have good mm -hmm. friends, you have good family, you know, you have those loving relationships. That makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And and so I think when you have a larger family, it gives you many more opportunities to have those bonds and those connections and that love. And so that really can lead to much deeper happiness than just mm -hmm. having. Uh, you know, a bunch of stuff, and I've got a vacation, I've got, you know, a brand new car. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine, but really what satisfies the heart much mm -hmm. more is, you know, love between friends, between right. family, etc. Right. We'll take a, a break. We'll come back and talk more about happiness. I know that's a theme throughout the book, and uh, you can do a great analysis of it. So we'll be back in uh, just a moment. Welcome back. Uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you about the, the question of happiness. What is it? And so often people go into marriage with maybe selfish, narcissistic attitudes and things mm -hmm. that are so contrary to marriage. Tell us the path to happiness in marriage. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I learned, I think, the most about happiness from a, a Jesuit priest named Robert Spitzer. And he talks about happiness in terms of four different levels. So someone who, who's a hedonist thinks the way to happiness is through uh, drinking a lot of alcohol, doing drugs, having sex, and they think they'll find their fulfillment in that. And then there's the egoist who thinks that, well, if I have lots of money, if I'm famous, if I'm powerful, well, then that's going to make me lastingly happy. Uh, and basically, I think there's really solid evidence, not just from theology, but also from philosophy and even psychology, 
that these paths to happiness really don't work very well at all. I mean, think mm -hmm. about the life of a celebrity, right? They have all the alcohol they can drink, all the drugs they can take, all the sexual partners they can have, lots of money, lots of fame, lots of power. And yet, unfortunately, we find many celebrities who are so deliriously happy that they end up killing themselves. Mm. So obviously, you can have those kinds of happiness in mega doses and still be empty inside and still be really not mm -hmm. happy at all. Mm -hmm. So where is happiness to be found? I think Spitzer's right that ultimately happiness is found in love of neighbor and love of God. And I think mm -hmm. that's why marriage is such a beautiful path to happiness. Anyone can, can have this happiness through love. Uh, single people, everybody can. But in marriage, you have <clears throat> the path made very clear as we're in specific. Mm -hmm. So when you make a resolution, say to be more healthy, that's not likely to go anywhere. But if, you, mm -hmm. if you're very concrete and specific and you say, well, I'm gonna you know, jog for three miles every morning, or I'm gonna go to the gym three days a week, well, that's much more likely to actually end up with you being more healthy. So in mm -hmm. a similar way, in marriage, you've made a very concrete vow of love for this particular person, and then when the children come, for these particular children. So you have, as it were, a very concrete and specific path towards having this happiness, which is found only in love. Right. So I think that's why all the surveys show that people that are married or people that have very close friendships are the happiest, right? It's yeah. not the most rich people or the most famous mm -hmm. people, it's people with the best relationships. Yeah. Right, right. There really yeah. is something to that mm -hmm. the part in marriage where um, uh, you know, my wife recently thanked me for something that I did for the family as a whole. Um, and uh, it wasn't anything, you know, over the top amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just, I saved all their lives when the house was burning down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> threw them on my back and ran through the wall. But aside from that, the no. The usual, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> standard operating exactly. procedure, yeah. <laughs> a lot of fire problems in my house. No, but it wasn't anything other than what, you know, we just do mm -hmm. to try to care for your family. And she thanked me for it. And I was so thankful that, that I had the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and I find so much joy in my heart in being able to serve them. Mm -hmm. Having this bond with my wife, having the gift of children, and being blessed to be able to give of myself for them gives me great joy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interiorly, deeply, mm -hmm. you know. You know, money, fame, popularity, which I've never really had a whole lot of any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but you're right. Uh, it, they're, they're, I, I don't mind living in relative obscurity with regards to what the world thinks is important. Mm -hmm. I don't mind living, you know, kind of getting by month to month when I have to. It's... Uh, um, I have a wife and kids and I get to serve. Mm -hmm. And there is a joy in being able to give of yourself. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah I, think, no, I, think that's, I think that's right. And, and to know that, uh, you know, because of the vow of marriage and, and because of the bonds of biology, that this can, goes on your whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, you know, a little nice happy life and the kids will be there. And it really is a beautiful thing. And I think sometimes people are afraid of marriage where they don't really, I think take into account the alternatives, right? Yes, of course, marriage has its ups and downs. There's difficulties. Yes, that's true. But every form of life has difficulties. If you were single, there'd be difficulties. If you were in a polygamous relationship, there'd be. I mean, whatever you do, we're human beings on planet mm -hmm. Earth. So, of course, there's imperfections mm -hmm. and difficulties and challenges, whatever mm -hmm. way you go. Now, speaking of that, that is something that you know we're seeing more of that kind of come up—the polygamy idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can you speak to that a little bit about you know, the pros and cons of, of this whole concept of having, you know, multiple wives, for example. Well, it's, it, it, there's an attempt to, nat or to normalize this, I think, on television. Not in our house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I floated that idea yeah. to Jennifer. What do you think, honey? Is that <laughs> I thought she could take over and do the dishes, and I'm taking off. <laughs> <laughs> she comes in, I go out. <laughs> no, but polygamy, actually, uh, people don't know this, but it's very common historically. About 85% of societies in world history were polygamous. And part of the great gift, I think, of the Catholic Church is uh, spreading the idea of Jesus that marriage is between one man and one woman and to combat polygamy, right? So many, even today, many, many societies, Islamic societies and all kinds of societies are, you know, polygamous. And, and when you look at the effects of this, it's very, very detrimental. It's detrimental to uh, children because there are often so many children in a polygamous household that the children don't really have the attention uh, of their father. He can't really invest in their well-being the way uh, he would be able to if he just had just one wife. Very detrimental to women. The uh, rates of domestic violence are much higher in polygamous relationships. Mm -hmm. Not only with the husband against the wife, but also all the wives fighting among themselves and competing with each other 
for you know goods and such. So it's it's quite detrimental, and people I think don't appreciate the value and the good of monogamy as much as they should. I mm -hmm. can't imagine. I mean, with, I mean, you can speak to this, Jennifer. Would that women would actually compete with each other for is that? <laughs> for him? No, no. <laughs> for me. I mean, you, know, well, you had a really good husband. He <laughs> was really, yeah, like him. No, no, no. But, 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 the, but is that is that? A, I mean, that is something that there would be competition within the women. Oh, I think there would yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, to be the most favored wife, I think yeah. there definitely would yeah. be. And yeah, and to have your children be favored. I mean, if there's one thing women are protective about, mm -hmm. oh man, Mama don't mess with the don't mess mm -hmm. with a woman's children. Yeah. So yeah. there's limited so, resources, yeah. and I need to give the resources to you know yeah. second wife's mm -hmm. children and not to your children. Mm -hmm. No, that's not. There's actually apply. quite a bit of physical mm -hmm. violence between that's right. the yeah. the sister wives. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. that is a beautiful part about marriage is that my wife chose me, I mm -hmm. chose her. Right. You know, and when she and I were dating, that was one thing we said to one another early on in the dating is, I want you to know that, you know, there's no, I'm yours, you're mine sort of thing. We're free to mm -hmm. choose to date anybody we want. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, that should be the case, but you know, you run into that sort of, you know, we're an item and don't even look at somebody else or I'm gonna get all jealous and bent out of shape. And mm -hmm. I wanted to know, I wanted to know without a doubt that she was choosing me. And mm -hmm. I wanted her to know that I was choosing right. her mm -hmm. above anybody and everybody else. And I can only imagine in a marriage, be like, well, I've got three wives or four wives. Yeah. Hmm, which one am I gonna really give my affection and right. attention mm -hmm. to? And let them know that you are everything. Right. You're my queen, you're right. my, you're my, um, the, the one that I will fight for, my right. damsel in distress, and I will, I will, I will slay the dragon for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And every woman wants to know that yes. her knight will slay yes. the dragon for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see the the kind of hmm. Mm -hmm. He's slaying mm -hmm. the dragon mm -hmm. for all of us. I don't like this. <laughs> no. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about in this country. Certainly, cohabitation now is on the rise. Less and less young people are getting mm -hmm. married. What's the problems with cohabitation? Yeah, that's one of the seven big myths that yeah. I talk about. That people tend to equate. Uh, marriage and cohabitation and think, well, there's really no difference, right? You have a ring on your hand, you've got a piece of paper, you know, there's no real difference in being married and, and cohabiting. But in fact, the evidence is very strong that there, there are quite significant differences. So for instance, on average, uh, polygamous couples are more likely to uh, have domestic violence disputes. They're more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. They're more likely to be unfaithful to each other. They're more likely to break up. Cohabiting. Cohabiting couples are. Mm -hmm. and, and they're more likely to divorce, right, if they mm -hmm. do get married. That's right, mm -hmm. and la that's the other thing is yeah. people think, well, if I live together before marriage, just will lower my likelihood of divorce, you know, when we get married. But the, the actu that's actually not true. In right. fact, what they found is the longer uh, a couple cohabits, the more likely it is that they'll get divorced. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe the thing that's missing is the real consent, right? That you, you give in marriage, you're not giving the full giving of yourself. Is that mm -hmm. the, the missing element there that's so vital? I think so, yeah. Some of the sociologists talk about it as sliding rather than deciding. Mm. And mm. The, the basic idea is that uh, you, you, you kind of move in together with someone that you know you really you wouldn't marry. But once you live together for a while, you get a couch together and you get a cat together and uh, you know, maybe even you have a baby together. And before you know it, the cost of breaking up mm -hmm. is so high that you kind of slide into marriage. Say, well, we're 32 now, oh, we might as well get married. But then the partner and the marriage or the, the relationship quality is not as high mm -hmm. as it would have been if you just hadn't cohabitated at all. Right. That's a, yeah, so you get enmeshed and so you wind up getting married because of this financial right. enmeshment mm -hmm. or whatever and not right out of love, so. Yeah, yeah. And I think that brings up too, like the uniqueness of marriage. What, what makes it different than other relationships that this consent is expressed in the totality of the person, right? That there a union is formed. Mm -hmm. You write very eloquently about that in the book. Describe that for us. Yeah, so, so in marriage, it's a unity that is, first of all, in the marriage ceremony, right? When you give verbal consent. Mm -hmm. Right? I take you to be my wife in good times and in bad and sickness and in health till death do us part. But then there's also a bodily physical consent afterwards in the marital act. That's unique to That's the man. Exactly, the yeah. exactly. So if you, of course, were to refuse this, to say the marriage vows, say you walked up there and you know mm -hmm. halfway through the ceremony, whatever, you ran out, well, you wouldn't be married yet. Mm -hmm. um, and if the marriage is not consummated, it actually can be annulled. They can, that's grounds for annulment. If one party says, look, I'm not, I'm not gonna consummate this marriage, right, right. that's actually grounds for annulment. Yeah. Let's talk about the other plague today, and that's uh, premarital sex. Um, you know, this idea that we'll see if we're compatible or something, and mm -hmm. how does that affect maybe a later marriage? 
Yeah, well, I think part of it is when that's uh, commonly allowed and practiced, what, pe what people often do is just put off marriage to a later mm -hmm. and later age. And I think there are some real detrimental effects. Um, you know, we know some young people that, that are engaged to get married and, and people are freaking out and say, oh, you're way too young to get married. This is such a, a big problem. Uh, but in fact, the, the research shows that couples that get married, you know, between 22 and 25, you know, relatively young, not super young, if you get yeah. married at 15, it's not a good idea, obviously. But, you know, younger are uh, actually report having the happiest marriages. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately in our society, um, there are some couples, of course, that, that think, well, I can't get married until I'm, I don't know, in my 30s and I've got, mm. uh, you know, I'm a law partner and I own a house and just, you know, they think of marriage only as a capstone to everything in their life being totally, you know, perfect, mm -hmm. right. rather than as a kind of cornerstone that you build a life together. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I know some of the facts you had in the book was that, you know, if they're both uh, spouses are virgins when they get married, it's 88% chance of being a successful marriage. If they've had one partner, it drops to 53. If they've mm -hmm. had five, it drops to 29.7. Right, you know? right. <laughs> so this idea of test well, driving, yeah. you know, is not, yeah. it's not mm -hmm. working. But, uh, and then you, uh, you had interesting statistics too about when a person has multiple partners, um, you would think, you know, our, our culture presents like this super active sex life is so fulfilling, but among women, uh, there's more crying, bouts of crying, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. lower mm -hmm. life satisfaction is reported. Mm -hmm. It seems like the woman suffers more, mm -hmm. doesn't she in this? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. she does suffer more. I think biologically there's some evidence that she does suffer more. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in part related to the, I think it's a hormone, oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Which is released when um, a woman is sexually involved with a man and that's a very, very powerfully um, strong bonding mm -hmm. hormone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And men don't experience that. Um, and so, yes, women are like sort I'm of. I'm often wondering, is it they don't have any oxytocin? No, they <laughs> do. <laughs> do. I think they do, actually. It's, yeah. it's a smaller amount. Yeah. It's just a smaller yeah. amount. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they do okay. have it, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. But yeah, I do think it is, I think it is harder on women. And, yeah. um, and that's part of yeah. the difficulty of cohabitation, also. Right. That cohabitation affects women more detrimentally than men. Yeah. And the yeah. reason for that is basically. When men are looking to get married, they value youth and beauty in a marriage partner more than women do. Yeah. And when women are looking to get married, they value um, the ability to provide, the ability to really be mature and supportive mm -hmm. more than most men do. Yeah. So if you think about a couple that moves in together, say at 25, and then at 32, they've been living together, say for those years. Well, over that time, most cohabiting couples don't get married, 80% don't get married. So over that time, what's happened is the man has gained generally more mm -hmm. of what most women are looking for in a marriage partner, right? Generally, he's more mature, mm -hmm. further mm -hmm. along in his career, better able to support a family. Mm -hmm. And the woman has lost more of what most men are looking mm -hmm. for in right. a marriage partner. Right. So here, as in many other instances, the church's teaching is something that really supports and enhances the well-being of women. Yeah. Are you sure you want to say on international TV that a woman in her early 30s is, is losing the the beauty, I'm, I'm, I just don't know, is that a... Oh, that, I, 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 get I, know. Letters and emails on I didn't say <laughs> that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just... <laughs> I, I thought one of the sad, sad things was that with multiple relationships, the woman, their oxytocin goes down. Yes. Right. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, she loses right. the ability to, to bond. bond. Exactly, yeah. 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 If, mm -hmm. Like, so something she's really mm -hmm. longing for in marriage mm -hmm. is, is being hurt mm -hmm. by right. the multiple partners and it, stuff. Right. It's a really beautiful thing, this idea of, you know, getting to an age appropriate, you know, an age appropriate age for falling in love mm -hmm. and then getting married. That's a really beautiful thing. That right. first partner with whom you bond mm -hmm. so intimately and so intensely, I think there's a reason that that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're seeing, you know, that happen and then break up because oh, they're too young, they, you know, you shouldn't do this, it's not, nobody, who gets married at 20, who gets right. married at 22, right. that's not wise. So then what happens? The next, you know, there's the next relationship of, okay, the bonding, but maybe it's not as intense, and maybe you're always thinking about that first love. Yeah. But you should be promoting that first love. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not if you're 16, yeah. maybe, you yeah. know, but right. within yeah. reason. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how parents sometimes can terrorize, right? I, see this, yeah. I see this constantly. I see this constantly among my peers, and mm -hmm. it, it it staggers me, and I actually call my friends on it when I see it. Yeah. Um, our daughter is uh, engaged. She's 22, and she's engaged, and we're delighted. Mm -hmm. We're not scared. We're not nervous. We're not, uh, we're yeah, happy for right, her. Right. And, um, <laughs> and people say to me, oh, aren't you worried? No, I'm not worried. They've been dating mm -hmm. for three years. It's appropriate. 
yeah. it's fine. Yeah. And, uh, and they, by contrast, are like, oh, we don't want our daughter to get married until at least uh, 30. 30 is really, mm -hmm. the, we've set that age as 30. And I, I why, why is 30 magical? Mm -hmm. And do you understand what's happening? You know, 28 is the peak of fertility. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's amazing to me how many parents are undermining their own children's mm -hmm. happiness by really not just not supporting marriage, but working actively against their children yeah. getting married. Right. Yeah, I think part so of it is that many parents are operating with misinformation. They, they are, they're operating and with misinformation. So it is true that if, yeah. if a couple gets married at 17 or 18 or 19, that actually is highly correlated with divorce. Right. But I think some people don't realize that once a man turns, say, 22, there's no difference in the likelihood of divorce if he marries at 22 versus 28. It mm. doesn't make any difference at all. So the idea that you have to push off marriage till you're almost 30 mm -hmm. in order to lower divorce rate, that's just not true. Mm -hmm. But it is widely believed. It is yeah. widely believed, right. Yeah. Now, you, you're very real, too, about problems. In the book, you have, there's some very funny anecdotes and things, but uh, you know, certainly young couples can have some big struggles in their early years. Yeah. And um, you give, a, a, I guess, a warning not to over-spiritualize things. Talk about that. Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm more don't of the. Talk too much. I, I know. <laughs> In fact, I think yeah. you said keeping it real, right? Your life. I'm more of the balancing. I, I'm more of the. I'm more of the. Really, you want to pray again? <laughs> um, no, I think every major fight we've had has been in Rome when Krista said, do you want to stop and pray? And I'm like, no, I want to, can we be done praying? <laughs> like everywhere we go, we pray here. But, um, but yeah, I do think you have to be a little bit cautious about that. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, even with your own marriage, there has to be a sense of liveliness and mm -hmm. fun. And I think that you do also have to recognize we live in this world. This is the world in which we live. Right. To be completely reclusive, I think is silly. And I don't think that it's helpful for other people. I don't think it spreads the gospel very well. Um, and then I'm really careful with my teenagers about mm -hmm. um, choosing my battles, you know. Right. You have a beautiful section in the book too about um, irreconcilable differences, the difficulties you do hit with your spouse and getting through those. You talk about forgiveness. Yeah. Talk about that. I, I always think Christi Christians have such an advantage there because that's, we're all about forgiveness. And you bring that into a marriage, that's yeah. powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely essential. Um, all couples have irreconcilable differences. Couples that divorce and are miserable, couples that are happy. Mm -hmm. There's no couple that, uh, maybe there's one in a million or whatever, yeah. but almost no couple that they always agree on everything and eye to eye and they're always in sync yeah. and everything's yeah. wonderful all the time. That's just not very mm -hmm. common at all. So there are going to be difficulties. We're fallible, fragile, weak human beings. So you'll say things that come out wrong. You'll just be in a bad mood and say things that are, mm -hmm. you're just upset. And that's going to happen. So I think part of uh, making marriage work is to be able to be humble mm -hmm. and to say to someone when you do something wrong, I'm really sorry. I, that I didn't, I was tired and I shouldn't have said that and that was, I was not my best self, please forgive me. And then right. on the other person to say, I for, do forgive yeah. you, I'll let right. that go. It's because okay. we're all weak yeah. and we all mm -hmm. struggle and uh, the, you know, mm -hmm. as long as uh, you know, we're walking on this planet, we're not gonna be perfect. And so I think forgiveness is so important, not just for marriage, mm -hmm. certainly for marriage, but, but also for all of our relationships. Yeah. You know, with, with children, children, with, with children, friends, with colleagues, I mean, yeah. People are people and they, yeah. they have difficulties and weaknesses and, yeah. and I think if you don't have that forgiveness, really it harms the person who doesn't forgive, right? Because right? mm -hmm. you walk around with a knot in your stomach and I'm gonna get that guy, I can't mm -hmm. stand her and you're plotting revenge. And you know, that, that's a way of really undermining your own happiness. Right, you talk about it being in the will, and not a, not a feeling, mm -hmm. yeah, or not forgetting. We can't force ourselves to forgive. Yeah, that. yeah, but forgiveness yeah. is not you know, getting amnesia. I mean, if right. someone, you know, if I were to come over to you and you know, punch you really hard in the face, yeah. you'd probably never forget it. Right. But, so forgiveness is not you know, getting amnesia, and it's not necessarily feeling better about it. Hopefully you can get there. Hopefully you can get to the point where you really do feel okay about it. Right. Mm -hmm. but, but forgiveness is a choice to treat the person in a kind, humane way even though they've done something bad to you. Right. And I think that's so important for our young people to hear because you're going to hit obstacles and you're going to have difficulties. I mean, you're bringing a man and a woman mm -hmm. together who think very differently just mm -hmm. yes. naturally. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's going to be plenty of material there to, <laughs> to forget. So. Yeah. We're yeah. going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment.
All right, welcome back. And we're talking with Chris and Jennifer Kayser about uh, their new book, The Seven Big Myths About Marriage. And I know, Chris, you talk about the importance of marrying a person of faith um, and how that's helpful. Not necessary for marriage, but uh, talk, talk about that aspect. I really do think mm -hmm. it's, it's very helpful. Sometimes people, young people can underestimate uh, the importance of marrying someone, say a Catholic marrying another Catholic. And uh, what the research shows is that actually marrying someone who shares your faith, say a Catholic marrying a Catholic, actually lowers the likelihood of divorce. Right. And what I found in, in my marriage is that, you know, Jennifer and I might disagree about, you know, this issue or that issue, even really big things. But having that shared background so that the most important things of all uh, we agree about and we're on the same page about. I think that's really important because it kind of gives you a shared mm -hmm. compass mm -hmm. and a shared framework because mm -hmm. again yeah. you might disagree about this or that that's going to happen mm -hmm. but the big things you agree about. Like the path of salvation. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and, for, risk, confession, yeah. and, and forgiveness and right. yeah. I think yeah. the biggest thing is confession. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> no, it does. It yeah. does help. I'm not yeah. kidding you. Yeah. Well, there, there is something in a marriage where, you know, you get into an argument with your spouse and you say you're sorry, you forgive each other, and then, depending upon the circumstances, mm -hmm. to know that you're both going to receive That's the right. grace of the sacrament yes. really reinforces your own personal uh, forgiveness and uh, yes, it does. to one another. Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. right. Because you right. know that you've, you've both yes. invited God that's into the right. situation right. through the that's sacrament. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the most beautiful things is when you can celebrate together and be just really, you know, joyful together. So, like, when the last thing in the book is a story about uh, when my, uh, our youngest daughter received her first Trolley Communion. Mm -hmm. And it was so wonderful to share that, not just with Jennifer, but, you know, the grandparents were there, extended family, everybody's so happy. She looks so beautiful. And we were just totally united and together and just completely, you know, overjoyed. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think if, you know, we didn't share that faith, then it would be kind of a different thing. I mean, you, you wouldn't recognize right. this as yeah. how important it is and you couldn't yeah. really celebrate as deeply. So I, th I think that's a real, both in the, in the challenging times and in mm -hmm. the joyful times, I think faith enhances and really brings people mm -hmm. together. So, so I, I really do encourage students to think about that carefully because as people mature, very often their life of faith and spirituality deepens. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're, you know, mid-twenties, whatever you think, ah, I'm, I'm not, not that into it, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when the first baby comes and it's time to baptize the baby and first communion comes around, I mean, mm -hmm. all of a sudden something that you didn't really think was such a big deal, you know, you may, as a more mature person, say, wow, this is really important. And faith right. can just bring you together, right. which is so beautiful. Right. And those quotes we read in the beginning about the, ma the marriage between the baptized is a sacrament that God mm -hmm. strengthens the bond and strengthens all the virtues necessary that's exercised in marriage, he's going to strengthen that and that marriage is caught up, as Vatican II said, in divine love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you encounter Christ in that marriage. It's mm -hmm. a real path to holiness. You right. know, that uh, right. it's sanctifying. And Not I only good, but sanctifying. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And when you share faith, I think it's so beautiful. It's my favorite part of the week. I mean, we're there together mm -hmm. at Mass. Mm -hmm. We've got the kids there. And it's just, a, you know, for mm -hmm. at least that hour, you know, all the troubles, we're not going to worry about those. And the squabbles, we're not going to worry about those. We're yeah. together. Go up to communion together. I mean, it really... You shake hands yeah. with a sign of peace. I know. That's <laughs> right. No, it really is. It's yeah. a beautiful yes. thing. And I think if, uh, you know, you married someone who wasn't Catholic and that person's at home watching football or whatever, right. well, you know, you're yeah. missing out. That's, right. that's a beautiful right. thing that could be a real moment of togetherness. Yeah. We know today uh, the culture is... It makes it hard uh, for family, for marriage, in uh, different ways. We hear that continually. Uh, I, I just heard a friend of mine was telling me a story. He did some mission work in Honduras, and there was a Honduran woman there who had lived some time in America and could stay here and continue, but she decided mm. to go back to Honduras. Mm. And she said the materialism was like driving her crazy. There's Interesting. Dr yeah, this drive for just yes. always this pressure to have more, to do mm -hmm. more, made her crazy. You know, mm -hmm. She went back to Honduras. Mm -hmm. But she went back in a nice car. I see not only, um, obviously the materialism is mm -hmm. rampant, but mm -hmm. what I've noticed is that um, parents have also turned their children into commodities. Yeah. So it's not that they just don't want to buy everything, right, and have everything. They want their children to then be these sort of perfectly, you know, wrapped uh, commodities, right. you know, and mm -hmm. that freaks me out. And I find yeah. it difficult to parent around that uh -huh. because, um, you know, I, ca I can't see, frankly, the sense in having a four-year-old play soccer. I, I, 
I guess, if you want to stand out there for <laughs> in the rain and watch a four-year-old fall over a ball, you can. Yeah. But um, you know, the anxiety about the ch every child's accomplishments mm -hmm. and and the anxiety about the future and and the stark competition that is creating very unkind children and very unkind adults mm -hmm. because people are not really just i think sometimes just enjoying their children right. as average children just people right. of god right they're not seeing them as as beautiful children of god but as these commodities that they have to perfect and sometimes when we have less children in a family, right, it yes. puts a lot more yes, pressure. Yes, it puts a lot more pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And sometimes and, they live and vicariously. Yes, too. I definitely yeah. see. Yeah. And whereas if me, I've, I'm, yeah. I'm too tired. I can't live vicariously through <laughs> anybody. I'm exhausted. I can barely live my life. Right. Um, right. Yeah, and I think also a danger with having, you know, obviously people can be limited in many ways mm -hmm. in terms of how many children they have. So this is in no way a judgment on how many children people have. But mm -hmm. if you are actually limiting yourself, thinking you're making things easier, I think you're not. And one of the things you're robbing yourself and society of is the richness of that diversity. Because we have kids across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. We have kids who are like, you know, excellent, excellent athletes. We have kids who don't care about sports. We have kids mm -hmm. who, you know, we have a spectrum. Um, same thing with school. And mm -hmm. it makes me a more compassionate person. You know, when I, when I meet people who have two perfect children, mm -hmm. they're insufferable. I would have been the most insufferable parent in the mm -hmm. universe if I had had like one child. Mm -hmm. And thank heavens I didn't. Thank yeah. heavens I have this, you know, and I... Yeah, I agree. I think one of the blessings of having a larger family is that it really draws out of each person uh, kind acts, patient yeah. acts, generous acts. In other words, a person can become more virtuous because, you know, there's all these opportunities to, to help. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that really helps grow a person and, mm -hmm. and mature a person and helps a person to, yeah. to be better than they would. I, I, I certainly mm -hmm. am a much better person than I would have been yes. right. if, you know, I didn't have have the children that I have. Not only to that child, but then to all of the children that remind me of that child. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I go out into the world and I see a child like my child who, suff who struggles mm -hmm. with something, then I embrace that child. Right. And I just think it's so, I, I just wish every, oh, I was really angry once, somebody was really irritating me and I said, yeah. She just needs to have eight more kids. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary was like, What is this case? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, She but just. Let's talk about the issue. Uh, I know a lot of young people are scared to get married mm -hmm. and and uh, maybe they've seen divorce in their families and and you have some difficult things from your yes. family yeah how did you overcome them and what was that like? um yeah so uh, my parents divorced when i was very young three mm -hmm. and then both parents went on to have multiple relationships um and that ended and then others began mm -hmm. and that you know in my dad's case that continued for mm -hmm. a very long time my mother did settle down and um so i had seen that and it was in no way appealing to me at right. all. Right. And then my mother, thank heavens for my mother, she kind of looked around and did an assessment and said, well, this is no way to live. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is no way to bring up my children. And she marched herself back to the Catholic Church. Yeah. And, um, and she took me with her. Yeah. And it was the best thing she ever could have done. And, and right. my mother is absolutely completely not prideful. And I really thank her for that because I see a lot of people who, who go through divorce. And it always frustrates me when they say, well, children are resilient. The children are fine. And I want to say, well, how about saying to your children, I'm really sorry. And they're suffering. And this right. wasn't a good thing for you. Right. And it breaks my heart that I, that I did this to you. Um, and acknowledging their pain so that they can move past it. My mother was really good about that. You know, mm -hmm. I've hurt you. This wasn't good for you. Right. This is how you cannot do this. This right. is how you can heal. This is how you cannot do this in your own life. And so, you know, she sort of led me to that. And the Catholic Church was extremely appealing to me. I mean, I got there. I was like that, you know, that kid in the chorus line who gets to dance class and never looks back. Mm -hmm. I got to the Catholic Church and never looked back. I was mm -hmm. like, this is, these people have it going on. <laughs> <laughs> we got about a minute left. Uh, parting shot uh, about the book and... Well, the book arose out of um, this class I teach on mm -hmm. happiness, love, and marriage. And the class is really fun to teach because the students bring a lot of energy and good questions. And I've been teaching it now for about 15 years. And so, oh. you know, Jennifer and I wrote the book to kind of be able to transmit these ideas right. to obviously, you know, outside of the classroom because right. you can only have a few students at once. So I do hope people, people like it and I hope that it is really helpful to people to think through marriage in, in a new way and hopefully I get a, uh, some new perspectives on it. And he teaches at Princeton, and he's got seven kids and been married 20, 22 years. 22 yeah. years. So. Well, thank you so much uh, thank you for being much. on the show. Thank you, Chris. Great, thank you. Well, may our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you. May he give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week.